Hello, and thank you for those of you who are here with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with a little housekeeping and our introductions before I let our panelists take over um, for their presentation. Um, the structure of this event will first be introductions, then a program with Natasha Vasquez and Lily Padilla, and lastly, some time to take questions and comments. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to uh, write your concern in the chat box and I will assist you there um, to make a question or uh, to ask a question or make a comment. You can raise your hand. There's a little raise hand button. Um, that way you can be unmuted to ask yourself. Um, you can also write it there in the Q&A or chat box and I'll ask for you and we'll address those at the appropriate time. Quandernos um, is a booklet series created by the Manitos Community Memory Project. The series reflects on the 1918 Spanish flu and COVID-19 pandemics through Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado. Graphic designer Lily Padilla and illustrator Natasha Vasquez will be presenting on this project, leading a discussion of the process of creating the Quandernos through its production phases. Lily Padilla is a graphic designer from Taos, New Mexico. Padilla attended New Mexico Highlands University and received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in May 2020 and is an intern in the Cultural Technology Mentorship Program through the Media Arts and Technology Department. Natasha Vasquez is an illustrator and animator from Taos, New Mexico, Vasquez attended New Mexico Highlands University and received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in May 2020. Um, and is also an intern at the Cultural Technology Mentorship Program. Please welcome Natasha and Lily for their presentation. Hi everyone. <laughs> Let's get started. Um, Oh, sorry. Oh, whoops. Sorry, it started at the end. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so we are part of the Monitas Community Memory Project. Um, we have been working on various projects and one in particular that we are gonna be talking about is the Quadernos as uh, you had heard. And so uh, let's get started. Um, we're gonna just skip the introduction since we, you know, we got the introduction already. So I'm gonna skip over that. Um, and I'll let Natasha start from here. So I'm Natasha and I first started working on, with the Manitos Community Memory Project back in 2019 for my first internship. I did these persona posters of like the curandera, the maestro, abuelos. And then I also worked on a short animation comic called Cafe Tole between a duel between coffee and atole where of course atole wins. And I also worked on some placements using the personal posters as coloring pages. And I'm Lily. I had started working with Monitos in 2020 um, during the summer, at the end of the summer. And we had started working on the Quadratino series where it was different stories and um, articles that were researched. And we had worked around those and created the Quadratino series. And um, I had also worked on the publication assets for that as well. The Manitos Community Memory Project main goal is to build an archive for families and people from Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado, even for those who have migrated out or come back. And our jobs as interns for them is to amplify and promote that archive.
So again, the Carlotta series, it's a, a, a booklet series that reflects on the 1918 Spanish flu and COVID-19 pandemics through the Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado. And this was um, created with uh, four stories. Um, well, three technically, one's actually a booklet. And this, yeah, so that's like what we had worked on. And then, so we had gone through a process of designing and doing the illustration assets. And so when it comes down to that, you have to do um, research and mood boarding phases because uh, it was gonna be discussed about the 1918 and 2020 pandemic. More so we wanted to kind of combine the two in a sense. But I think we kind of started to lean towards like 1918, 1920s, like uh, modern art. So we had gone through the mood board phases where we were decided to go through and look at some uh, publication and look through color schemes, typography to kind of represent that theme. And for my research, I wanted to look at publication to kind of use that art style as part of the covers and, you know, use those type of assets as well inside the, uh, the booklets. So these were like inspirations to kind of like how the covers came about. Um, and I, this is like where I did my research for like the typography, the um, design of like the covers. And then this is where Natasha had went into the illustration assets. Yeah, so once we figured out a general direction that we wanted to go in, we began the sketching phase. I went in a more plant vibe and Lily went with a more 1920s inspired look. So I went with like woodsy and vines and plants. And then we did sketches of cover ideas, one of them being a split room where one side was 1920s with old radios and old furniture and like a kerosene lamp and the other side was more modern. And then I also did sketches of some plants and borders and we kind of just tried to get all our ideas out. And so I put textures and patterns in the plants, but of course we ended up going with a more hollyhock as the main design element. And we chose to go with that with a style that combines hand-drawn elements with digital and so I hand drew the flowers like the hollyhock and lavender and I took that into Photoshop and then we could use it in our booklets. And then to make the mountain, I actually crumpled up a piece of um, cut bar, um, construction paper. And then I took a picture of that and cut it out and used cardboard cardstock to make the Adobe house. Okay, so for this booklet, we um, for this cover inspiration, we had um, included Doña Sebastiana in this illustration in particular because she was mentioned in part of the introduction of this booklet um, as it discusses the 1918 Spanish flu in Taos County. Um, a lot of this research was uh, done by Esteban and he had found newspaper articles from uh, the La, La Revista de Taos and that's where it had the list of people who had passed on from the 1918 Spanish flu. And it was during the winter months of the second wave that occurred. And with this, we had, uh, used, so that's how it became about. And the reason we had used Doña was because she was, um, the way, like the way it was described for like that introduction, it's like whether her name was invoked um, a protector or feared for the shadow she cast in 1918, she arrived in the villages of Taos County. So that's kind of where we had lead, like led to have her as like part of that cover because she was a, you know, like a very much personified in Northern New Mexico and in Colorado, Southern Colorado. The next issue was called Narrating Death. And it is an extension of the first booklet. It has obituaries found in the same newspaper, La Revista newspaper, that were sent in. 
And so for that one, for the cover, I chose to do a periodista, which is a newspaper writer or storyteller journalist. And I did one from 1920s. So he has the all the old stuff, like the old newspaper, a journal, a typewriter, and the, the printing press that was in the back that would have been used to make the papers. The next issue is called La Curandera. And of course, more of the information was done by Esteban and Shane Flores. And it lists and describes some of the known curanderas that were around. And then it discusses many of the herbs and remedies that were prepared and used. And for this one, I ended up using a persona poster that I had created back in 2019 of the curandera. And I just adjusted the background. So I added an adobe house made out of paper and of course, some textured paper in the background. Oh, sorry. Okay, so for this cover and for this booklet, it is a blank journal that has a uh, lined paper, like uh, lined sections, and then it has blank sections. So you can either write or draw. Um, the inspiration for this cover was to kind of have like, um, like a a leather kind of journal booklet. So with this, I had actually designed this um, by taking a picture <laughs> of a purse, funny enough, and I had used uh, that texture as the background. And then I had actually illustrated the floral um, at parts of the, uh, of the booklet. And I had went into Photoshop and had done some like a embossed kind of technique on it. So it kind of looks like it's uh, like more stamped into it. And I wanted to kind of just like have that as like, you know, a journal like that would be used like around that time. Cause I saw that a lot of the journals um, had like these patterns or textures. So I wanted to include that as well for part of that. And that's how I had designed that cover. So quarantine and creating, we wanted to talk a bit about of our experience about graduating and then going into this internship and having to do it in like two separate areas. Cause we normally would do it in our media arts building where we had big computers and we could work together more easily. And so we had to share files through Google and emails and we had many, many Zooms. And there was a time where like we had to really think about the separation from home and work. Cause I personally have my desk and computer in my room. And sometimes you can get a little burnt out and from separating those two things. Yeah, I would agree. And then I think at some point there was just so many emails and exchanges that had occurred. So it would kind of be hard to keep track of everything because there was so much um involvement in this and there was so much that we had to share amongst each other um but yeah definitely the separation from your home and workspace was uh hard because it was kind of like if you had to activate like your work mode like like your mindset for that and then having to kind of do that as well but for at home and I felt like I was kind of always thinking about work in <laughs> the times I didn't need to um and it was, yeah, it was definitely hard. And that's where a lot of burnouts happen, but event eventually like, you know, like it, we get passed through that, but you know, that's a shared experience. I think everyone had at that point when it came to working from home. So originally when, so I wanna talk about like the, how the cuadernos had originally planned to just be digital and how we had transitioned into a publication phase. Um, we had gotten funding to publicize um, uh, copies of these uh, cuadernos. And so when it came down to that, I had to kind of redesign and kind of, I had to make copies of each of the journals um, files that I had and redesign and organize it um, for publication because uh, publication spreads are a lot different than just having a straightforward digital. So I had to go into that and then I had additionally added pages to kind of add up to the 
publication mark for printing because as whenever it comes to printing, you have to go by four, um, four pages. Um, so um, they have, yeah, so it's kind of uh, the back and front, like the front section and the back section. So that's how it counts as like four. And so besides wanting to publish, like just have the booklets, we wanted to have additional elements. It had got inspired by a letter that the New Mexico Historic, um, I mean, New Mexico Humanities Council had sent um, and just wanted to include into the booklet what we had decided let's bring this into a creative way and uh, use to use this like um, this letter that was given. So we decided to use that text and put it on the bookmark and have that as part of like a takeaway in the in the cuadernos, like the, um, the, like the booklets, like so to not only just have that, but to kind of have stickers because the illustrations that Natasha had drew were so beautiful that we wanted to be able to share that. And so that's how we decided to have those elements, but we also wanted to have everything put together. So we had made a wraparound for that. And that's where I had used Natasha's other um, design assets and had uh, created that into the, the wraparound. So we wanted to talk about the importance of the work we're doing and archiving. And so the first one is it anchors us to our past and it gives us a sense of identity. For me, that really makes me think about my, in my grandma's house, there's a picture of my great, great, great grandmother. She's dressed in traditional Navajo clothing. And I don't know anything about her. And the people that knew more about her are no longer alive. And so I'm gonna have to really do my research, maybe find cousins to find out more about her. But it's gonna be really cool to find out more about her and share it with the rest of my family. And um, another thing about um, the importance of archiving for us is to, I think is to avoid past mistakes. Um, when we were creating these booklets, um, I was talking with Estevo on how he was explaining like a lot of similarities that were occurring with the, the 1918 Spanish flu and the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where a lot of people did not um, quarantine a lot of times, they were breaking the quarantine a lot, or they were just were not wearing masks, as I guess that was a big thing too, was to wear masks at the time. And, you know, just, uh, you know, not following like, the protocols that should should have been done. So that was a past mistake that I think we kind of had to learn on from that. Yeah. And so the next one is, we can share this knowledge with future generations because when stories are lost, they are lost to us forever. And for me, this project has pushed me to ask my own grandparents about their past and share their stories with me. I'm currently working on a couple of animations, one of them being about my grandfather being a sheep herder. And if it wasn't for this project or Manito's community project, I'm not sure I would know much about him or that he was a sheep herder and how that affected my grandma's childhood. And so I'm gl glad I'm getting the chance to ask those questions now that I can. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for the next one, um, it can preserve our language um, or it can preserve language. For me, as an example, I think about how there was certain like um, Spanish words that my grandpa would say to me that are in, like, ref, you know, not, <laughs> not commonly used, I guess now, but it's for me, like if he ever asked me to get anything from the fridge, he would refer the, to the fridge as the hilera. And that translates into icebox instead of refrigerator, because in Spanish, or at least I know regional Spanish, it translates to refrigerador, or that's how I've learned that in Spanish class, because in my head, I always knew the refrigerator is la hilera, or there's other words for me that I had used, or that, I had, that had been used around me to describe other things, or objects, uh, anything, and it was different from what I was taught like in school. 
So that's where I learned the difference in that. So it can preserve culture. And so that makes me go back to the curandera booklet where I got to research curandera remedies and I got to illustrate them. And during the Spanish flu, they used those remedies. And so it was cool being able to like walk into Taos Herb Store and seeing those same plants that are being collected and used for those same remedies is really cool that we still get to do that. And then the next one is to remember those before us. And so I go back to the other narrating death or the Doña Sebastiana one. And I look at the people that had died of the Spanish flu. And I saw some people who died who had shared the same name as me and died in the same location I grew up, but I had never heard their names before. And so I'm not sure if I'm related to them or not, but it's really important to collect those stories and to share those people who had lost their lives and are no longer with us. But it's also important to collect because you wanna share those things with the community before they're forgotten. I agree. And for part of my spirit experience with this was um, I was cleaning my grandpa's house and my mom and I had stumbled upon um, like a little uh, box uh, that had some uh, papers and just like other kinds of things like, you know, um, that was collected. And we had seen a lot of letters from that my great grandmother had had from her friends while she was living in San Francisco. And at the time I didn't know that she actually was welding for the military in that area. So that was interesting to know and reading the letters um, that her friends had sent her when she was living there. And I thought that was really interesting because I had not known much his, like any detail about her. So to like kind of learn like what she had done, it was very interesting. And I wouldn't have known about that if I hadn't gone and found that box just from cleaning and helping uh, my mom clean my grandpa's house one day. So if anyone ever uh, wants to uh, get wonder how to archive or archive with money those, um, we have different contacts. Um, we have a blog site that has a resources um, section that you can find and it has, um, it explains how to archive. There's also a section where you can um, contact. And if you wanted to find another way to contact by not using the blog site, there's also a Facebook page. Um, we do have other social medias as well as Instagram and Twitter, but these are the main ones I would say to reach to archive for um, if you wanted to continue archiving with us or just to share anything or share some stories, anything that you might think that is interesting to share. So that is what we have for our presentation. Um, so uh, we can take time to ask, uh, answer some questions or have some comments. And um, if there's anything you would like to see like back on the presentation, let me know. Um, I don't see any questions from participants right now, but um, what were both of your favorite parts of this project? Um, what was the most you, you personally gained from all the work you've done on this? Um, for me, it was really came down to like the covers because that was a big part of what I did for this project and being able to really do that research and just dig into what I thought each character should be was really powerful to me, I think. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it was just um, this transition from the digital to publication. Um, that was kind of, because um, that wasn't a uh, part of the arrangement was to, or not, it wasn't originally planned to have publicized. So to start designing with something that was already created and to uh, make everything, you know, print was um, really um, interesting. And I guess like it was uh, more like um, more practice for me from 
the, just from the little experience of how to publication. So it kind of helped with, uh, you know, and just kind of, um, you know, it was fun doing that. I had a lot of fun trying um, new things like that and to be able to do that with these cuadernos and then also just create new elements for that with the assets that Natasha had created with the hollyhocks and the mountains. That was where I had a lot of fun doing that. Thank you. Um, and at the library, I know we just started um, uh, adding your, the, these notebooks to our collection, to our special collection, um, which leads to this question submitted by a participant that says, thank you for the presentation. Where can I see the print version of your project? Uh, you could reach out to Ellen um, Dornan at the New Mexico Histori uh, Humanities Council. I keep saying historic, I'm sorry. The Humanities Council. Um, and you can uh, find those, um, I'm, I believe, on the, the Humanities Council website. But I also think uh, there is, uh, you can actually find it on the blog site. There is a section where it has talks about the cuadernos. And you can uh, request for the print versions of that there. Or um, if you wanted just to have a digital version, it's found there as well. Um, I can, let me stop sharing my screen and I can link that there for you. Oops. And will you guys um, be continuing to um, work on this project or what are the next upcoming projects you both are working on? Um, well, recently we had worked on a museum uh, exhibition with um, alongside with Melissa Rogers and uh, we had worked on uh, following the money the trail. So that was a recent project we had finished. And we are in the beginning phases of a volume two of these cuadernos. It's a very early stage that we are at right now but we are um, starting the process of doing that. So that's exciting. That is exciting, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put the link for the blog site that has um, this, uh, that talk discusses the cuadernos and on the bottom, it has the link to the digital version if anyone wanted to see the digital version or you could request the public site, the publication ones. So I'm gonna just add that link there if um, anyone wants to find that. Thank you. And when I put this recording on YouTube, I'll post that in the um, description as well. Okay. Um, well, oh, let's see. Yeah, no, it doesn't look like there's any more questions now. Um, but if there were any follow-up questions, where could people contact both of you? Or is it also manitos.net? Uh, you could contact us through that. Um, we can also share our emails, so we'll share that here as well. So here is uh, my email if anybody wants to have any questions or reach out. Um, and I can answer or share anything that, um, is, uh, that anybody asks for um, relating to Monitos. And if there's any other questions about the cuadernos, we're, we're happy to answer those. Awesome, thank you. And thanks for putting together this amazing project. It's really impressive and um, interesting. And I'm excited that we'll have it on the shelves here at the Santa Fe Public Library as well. I appreciate all the work you guys put into this. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Today. Um, one more question and then we'll, we'll close this out. Um, participant asks, do you have any contributors to your project? Are there others doing similar projects? Um, uh, other projects right now, well, we act, there's actually other interns that are working with Monito. So, um, and they're actually part doing the archiving and digitizing um, a lot of files right now. So like a lot of videos 
tapes, um, photography. So they're actually involved with them. Um, this like participant of the Monitas project as well. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Natasha. And good luck to all your future projects. And thank you for this project you've gifted to our community. Uh, appreciate you both and everyone for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Everyone take care. Thank you. Thank you.